Amen. Open your Bibles, if you would please, to a few places, Genesis 3, 4, and 6. Genesis 3, 4, and 6 at the beginning. John 3, Romans 3, and Ephesians 5. Genesis 3, 4, 6. John 3, Romans 3, and Ephesians 5. You'll want to have those handy, uh, because in the second part of the sermon, uh, that I'm going to try to get to as soon as possible, in the second part of the sermon, we'll be using those passages to answer our question today, which is this, will God allow our disobedience and idolatry to go unpunished? And we're using a shorter answer, a shorter version of the answer that we're going to be reading here in just a second today. It's the Scott Wakefield shortened and condensed version. Uh, Let's go ahead and say it together at all three campuses. Uh, Here we go. No, all sin is ultimately against God's character and opposed to his law. He is justly angry at sin, and he will justly punish them in time and for eternity. Now, we're going to do this in two parts. In the first part, we'll be making a theological argument about why today's answer makes sense. So on the first part especially, you're going to have to pay close attention. The second part too, but it does its, it does its own thing kind of organically through the use of the word. So why today's answer makes sense? It makes sense. I'll give you the punchline before we get started. It makes sense because God is holy. And that's the only possible way that the answer would make sense. You see, the problem with our sin, not just idolatry as we talked about last week, the problem with our sin is that it replaces rightful worship of God as creator and it ultimately worships and serves self instead. And that is a much, much bigger problem than we think. It's a much bigger problem than we think because it puts something into a place that only a holy God can actually occupy. It's an eternal square peg, round hole problem. And so when we are giving our hearts to anything less than God, anything less than his perfect eternal character and nature, anything less than his entire holiness, that is functionally a rebellion against him that ignores that holiness and that thus invites his wrath. Even more so, God's holiness means he literally cannot, in any form or fashion, he cannot, because he's holy, he cannot accept, abide, be okay with, or even be around sin. And even more so, part two, God cannot not punish sin. And for him to not receive all the honor and glory and worship that he is actually due because he is holy would be the ultimate injustice in all of the universe and in all of history. That's how holy God is. And how categorically not God and not holy we are as a result of our sin and rebellion against him. And for him to not receive all honor, glory, and power that he is, do, and will demand, for him not to receive all that would be a problem akin to what uh, Charles Spurgeon, mid to late 1600s London preacher, it's akin to what he said, or as we're paraphrasing him to say, to not punish the guilty is to exact the penalty of suffering from the innocent. So from God's perspective, this is true. To not punish the guilty is to exact the penalty of suffering from the innocent. And even from our perspective, we kind of understand what that means, and we pretty intuitively and innately understand it, because to not punish the guilty is to exact the penalty of suffering from the innocent. Just think about it. It's only right that the one who commits the crime, the one who is guilty, is the one who pays the penalty. That's justice. That's justice. And this need for paying the penalty to right the wrongs 
is because something has to always be done about sin. You see, sin isn't just this theoretical, up there, nebulous, mumbo jumbo idea to which we give intellectual assent. Sin is an actual problem before an actually holy God. And there's a need for paying the penalty anytime there's a sin. And to not do something about sin, to not punish the guilty, is to let the sin go unaccounted for in a way that forces the innocent party to suffer the injustice of something having been stolen from them. So, when someone is, for example, when someone's abused, and there's, there's no repayment for that wrongdoing, then that wrongdoing, it remains. It's still there. Something has to be done about injustice. Something always has to actually be done about sin. You can't just while it away or wish it away. It actually still remains if that guilt has not been paid for, made up for. It remains in a way that ends up forcing the penalty of the suffering to be transferred to the innocent victim. It gets even more complicated than this. <laughs> even more than that. The shrapnel of unpunished sin can be spread across many victims. For example, when the government uses taxpayer money <laughs> to facilitate the murder of babies in the womb, or to facilitate the surgical destruction of a child's organs, there's a lot of guilt to go around. The government is guilty not only for immorally forcing the taxpayer to be financially complicit in that evil, it's also guilty for enabling the sin of others, but worst of all, the penalty of suffering ends up being exacted and carried out on innocent children. And so we all, we all understand what we mean by Unpunished, unpunished sin not being paid for being a problem. And we all intuitively, we bristle. We bristle against failure to punish the guilty. And here's the rub. We all love to apply this principle of justice for sin to ourselves. That's the part we intuitively quickly understand. We love to apply the principle of justice for sin to ourselves, especially to inflate or to reinforce our innocence. But we usually do so without so much as giving a single thought to how this applies to God, let alone how the principle of justice for sin must be applied to him. So, part one basically over. In today's answer, when we say that all sin is ultimately against God's character and opposed to his law, and that he is justly angry at sin, and he will justly punish that sin in time and eternity, all of that only makes sense if God is holy. So, that's why, that's why we're making this argument, because God's holy. Now, let's see some examples of the Bible's teaching in part two here about God's just anger and punishment at sin from his holiness. If God were not holy, everything we're going to say here in part two would not apply, doesn't matter, is not a problem. So in part two, let's look at where the Bible tells us what God does as a result of his holiness at sin because of evil. And this is going to be a whirlwind, so buckle up. Genesis 3, 4, and 6, a few places in John 3, Romans 3, and Ephesians 5. We're not slowing down for you to catch up and find your place. So, three scriptural arguments in this second half that we're making. Number one is this. God justly judges, as we've kind of already implied and said, from his holy character. A few places in Genesis to make this clear. Genesis 3, 8. This is immediately after Adam and Eve's first sin against God. It says this in verse 8, chapter 3. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Remember that phrase, the cool of the day. We're coming back to it. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife 
hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Now, this phrase that we pointed out here earlier, the cool of the day, may seem on the surface to mean nothing important um, because most plainly and most literally translated, we're going nerdy here, we're going Hebrew nerd for just a bit here. This phrase, cool of the day, most plainly and literally translated can mean either cool, as the ESV says, cool or wind, same idea, cool or wind, or spirit, wind, spirit, same exact word. The word here for wind, cool or wind, is the exact and far and away most used word in the New Testament for the Holy Spirit. Which means there's probably something more going on than just, ooh, they heard God walking in the garden at that time of the day where the wind came through and it was cooler than normal. More and more, uh, nerdy Hebrew scholars, of which I am not one, but I read a lot of them, say this is what we would call the first judgment theophany. Theophany is a fancy word that means the appearance of God in some form or fashion that, that is a representative of God. It could be an angel. It could be Christ. It could be a vision of Christ. It could be the Spirit of God. All of those forms of God appearing happen in the Old Testament, perhaps first in this instance where a spiritual appearance of God happens at that moment immediately after their sin to judge their sin, which makes the most sense given the context. And just to speak to some of the, the differences between wind or cool of the day and spirit, the main reason most modern English Bibles uh, don't translate it that way um, <laughs> It's because they lack courage, I think. Uh, it's out of a desire to avoid controversy, and they want to err on the side of being cautious and to avoid translation becoming interpretation, which are all good things. So they like to say, it just means the cooler wind of the day, blowing through the garden. But that creates a whole bunch of contextual problems. As if it isn't clearly accompanied by the entire context of God coming to judge Adam and Eve. So, if this means spirit of the day, and in Hebrew, all of that same stuff can mean day of the spirit. Genesis 3.8 is a precursor to what the Bible unpacks after this moment, time and time and time again, about the coming of the Lord the day of the Lord, the judgment of the Lord, his presence as holy God coming to judge sin. So they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool or the spirit of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They knew they had offended God's character, his holiness. They'd ignored his laws, which is more evidence that this cool of the day idea is probably the spirit of the day or the coming of the spirit in that moment to judge their sin. Now jump down to Genesis 3, verses uh, 23 and 4. We see more of the presence of God's holiness against sin. Verse 34, therefore, because of their sin, Adam and Eve's sin, the Lord God sent him, sent Adam, representative head for Adam and Eve in this case. Therefore, because of their sin, the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden, which we know from verse 22 and the preceding context was, on the one hand, yes, it was God's grace so that they wouldn't stay permanently in that place of forever being condemned before God's holiness. But notice how it's also judgment because it takes them out of God's presence and into their frustrating sin-cursed work. The Lord God sent him out 
from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. <laughs> like, you've got to get out of here. It almost sounds like it was necessary for a holy God to say, you can't, you can't be around me anymore. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and the flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. You can't get back in here, Adam. Genesis 4, 10 through 12. More of God's just judgment based on his character in the account of Cain and Abel. Verse 10 says this. And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. Because it's crying for justice against Cain's sin. And now you are cursed from the ground, verse 11, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. More consequences before a just judge. Also check out Genesis 6, verses 11 through 13. This is describing the events surrounding the time of Noah and the flood and the ark. Verse 11 says this, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. Most of the time in the scriptures, when God sees something or it's in his sight, it's a description of God's holiness, his purity, seeing through and exposing all. We see a lot of that in Revelation when Jesus looks and sees the sin and comes to judge. Same idea here in verse 11. The earth was corrupt in God's sight, meaning compared to God's holy character, and the earth was filled with violence. And God saw, second seeing, saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And this is the, the here and now judgment, verse 13. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end to all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So we see here in Genesis 4, I'm sorry, Genesis 3 and 4 and 6, we see this pattern beginning from the very first pages of Genesis of God justly, righteously, from his holiness, judging from the ground of his holy character, judging in a way that follows throughout the entire scripture. So, second of three scriptural arguments. And numbers two and three go together, as you'll see. First being God justly judges from his character. Second is this. Everyone not believing in Christ as Savior is already rejecting God as holy creator and is justly condemned. Everyone not believing in Christ as Savior is rejecting God as holy creator and is already justly condemned. This may be a bit of a foreign concept to you, even if you've grown up in church for a long time, but I'm not making this up because it comes straight from Jesus in John chapter 3, where Jesus is in conversation with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a Jewish Pharisee who was a member of the Sanhedrin, the, the ruling body, the ruling religious body for the Jews at the time. And Jesus confronts Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John starts off by telling us this, verse 1. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, implication being he didn't want to be seen, talking to this guy who claims to be the Messiah. And he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. In some form or fashion at the time, we see this at the end of John chapter 2, there were a number of the Jews who were beginning to, quote, believe in him, at least ostensibly, theoretically, on the face of it, on the outside, because Jesus was doing all these, these signs that showed something, something from God is happening. And so Nicodemus is kind of testing this out. And, and in the context, Jesus makes clear, you don't believe in me. Pick it up, verse 3. Jesus answered him, truly, truly. I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless you are spiritually reborn, Nicodemus, you cannot so much as even see the kingdom of God. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, 
How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, same idea. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, from a cleansed through God's Spirit kind of rebirth, a spiritual rebirth, unless that's the case, not only can he not see the kingdom of God, he can't even see it, he also can't enter it. Why? Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. When Jesus says, by the fruit you will know, the externals show the internals of the source of one's birth. That's from flesh is obviously flesh. That's born of spirit is spirit. You don't believe in me because you're born of flesh, Nicodemus. You can't even see the kingdom or enter the kingdom because you've not been reborn by the Spirit. You are not birthed of the Spirit. You're birthed of the flesh. Verse 7, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So Jesus is making the point that Nicodemus doesn't believe in his own claims about being from God the Father because... Nicodemus isn't born of the Father, not born of God's Spirit. Now, jump down to verse 16, where it starts to get interesting. Jesus expands on this idea to include the idea that Nicodemus' unbelief is the same as being condemned. Unbelief in Jesus is the same as being condemned already. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him, which is a participial phrase that means the ones who are believing in him. They should not perish but have eternal life. But here's the rub. Verses 17 and following. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Press pause real quick. Often quoted, the father did not send the son to condemn the world. As if Jesus isn't being judgy because he's very tolerant. That's a terrible mistranslation of what's going on, a misunderstanding of what's going on. It doesn't even read past verse 17 to understand Jesus isn't being nice or tolerant or not judgy. His presence is judgment. That's what Nicodemus didn't even understand yet. Him being there is judgment. He doesn't need to judge because all who believe, who, all who don't believe are condemned already. Jesus says it himself. Don't believe me? Keep reading verse 17. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it because it's already condemned through unbelief. But in order that the world might be saved through him, here it is, verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned from Jesus' mouth. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he's not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Remember we said that Jesus' presence alone is judgment. This is the judgment. He says, verse 19, oh, you mean Jesus does judge? This is the judgment. The light has come into the world, which in the Gospel of John is Jesus. Jesus is that light. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. They were born a flesh. Their works show whose sons and daughters they are, Jesus says in the context. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The presence of Jesus himself is judgment against sin. Verse 21. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been carried out in God. Now jump down to the very end of the chapter, verse 36, where John summarizes all this by saying, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son, parallel idea to believing in the Son, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So unbelief in Christ is a rejection of God that results in being justly condemned. 
which leads finally to the third of three scriptural arguments. Unless, unless they trust Christ as propitiation, fancy word we'll come back to, propitiation who bears their punishment. In Romans 3, Paul has been making an extended argument about what happens because of sin that is much like the kind of thing that Jesus just said in John chapter 3. And he turns at this point in Romans 3 to describe the righteousness of Christ as the one who bears the punishment of sin. He says, but now, in contrast to being justly condemned, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested, made known, apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And this applies to all, meaning Jew and Gentile. For there is no distinction, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified, declared by God righteous and just. How? By his grace, by his blessing and favor and goodness and love set upon those who accept the free offer of his gift. So, all are condemned except for those who are justified by his grace as a gift. And here's the key where it turns into the redemption and the payment for penalty and the way that God has to do something about sin. This happens through the redemption, by the paying back, the buying back that happens in Christ Jesus, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, notice this, whom God put forward. God himself put forward this payment for our sin. Out of the goodness and mercy and grace of a God who has no responsibility in terms of his holiness to do anything for us, he puts him forward as a propitiation. As the one who assuages and satisfies satisfies God's just and righteous anger against sin and evil. And how does he do this? By his blood, by his sacrificial death, which only works as a sacrifice if that death is a sacrifice that is a perfect sacrifice, blameless in every possible way before God the Father. Which means the only possible way that we can have relationship with God, who is holy, is if he puts forward a penalty to pay for us, to lessen and assuage and satisfy his own wrath. And this happens by the blood of Christ, end of this sentence, that is received by faith in him. And why did he do this? I love this. This was to show God's righteousness. He did this to make known his own holiness. He did this to continue to carry out his purpose of bringing himself all the honor and glory. Not because he's some sort of egomaniac in the sky who doesn't deserve it, but because he's actually holy in ways that only he deserves and that he will make happen and that he demands is going to happen. And it's just every moment that he does it. And the reason that sounds crazy to us is because only he is holy and we are not. And we understand everything other than perfection that deserves and demands all honor and glory. And so he does all of this for us in a sense, yes, but not for us. He does this to show his righteousness, his holiness in Christ, Because in his divine forbearance, in his mercy and long-suffering for us that paid the penalty, he had passed over former sins. And then to bring it all together, verse 26, so cool. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be both 
just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So that he would remain holy, which has to be the case. And yet, at the same time, the one who justifies the one who has faith. Now, I couldn't say this any better than the ESV study Bible notes that I came across on Romans 3.26. So we're going to put this on screen while I read it. It says this. In the cross of Christ, God has shown himself to be just, meaning he's entirely, utterly holy in and of himself, perfect in every conceivable way, and categorically other and different in a way which is so true that the things that we are like about him and pointing to him are a reflection of him. But they don't come from our character and nature without his existence. So he's utterly holy. So he's just because the penalty demanded by his own moral law is not merely taken away, right? This isn't a theoretical God saying, uh, let's just go ahead and undo that. We would still be condemned in our sin because something has to be done about sin if he is righteous and holy. So he doesn't just remove it, but he actually pays for it. He pays for it by Christ so that he would remain just and yet he is also the justifier. He's the one who provides the means of justification, declaring people to be right and standing with himself. And the savior of all who trust in Jesus. Now here's the beauty of it. This is the heart. Here is the heart, it says, of the Christian faith. For at the cross, God's justice that has to be maintained and his love meet at the same time. So at the moment of the death of Jesus on the cross, God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, all holy, have to remain holy. It can't be otherwise. And yet, in a broken, sinful, cursed world, because of our sin, from which we cannot have relationship with him, he maintains his justice in a moment where he extends to us his never-ending loving kindness and grace and mercy that we don't deserve and we could never earn and that must depend on him. Now, friends, this truth is the most beautiful and important truth in the universe. It's the most important hope you can have. Why? Why? Because, friends, very soon, you will face a holy God. You will face a holy God who comes in righteous anger to burn away the dregs of all sin and all evil and all death so that only his absolute glory forever remains. Friends, you will very soon Face a holy God. In the Old and the New Testaments, the Bible talks about the, the day of the Lord or the day of judgment that describes him visiting his holy judgment and pouring out his wrath on sin. In time now, in the past for some of the Old Testament and New Testament folks, and in the future. Throughout the Bible, this coming of the Lord is his judgment against sin that burns away everything other than his absolute and pure glory forever. This is promised throughout the scriptures. In the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Zephaniah, Malachi, they all warn that the day of the Lord is coming as a warning that's intended to cause people to repent of sin and to depend on the one who is both just and justifier. It's a warning to say, I'm coming and this will happen in a way which means you'd better be ready because you're going to face a holy God. He's telling us we're going to face him. 
Ecclesiastes 12 says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Obadiah, the first chapter says, The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you've done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will turn upon your own head. 1 Peter 4 says, They will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Hebrews 9 says, It is appointed by God for man to die once. And then after that comes judgment. Jude 7 speaks of how Sodom and Gomorrah are an example because they undergo a punishment of eternal fire. Revelation speaks of a lake of fire that's a place of eternal punishment for those who do not believe in Christ and as Lord. Friends, the truth of the scriptures and what God tells us about his holiness is that very soon we will all face a holy God, which is why in Ephesians 5, Paul speaks with urgency about these things. He says in verse 5, you may be sure of this, certain of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or pure, or impure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Verse 13, but when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, Arise from the dead. Wake up and realize that when a holy God comes, there is only one penalty for the guilt of your sin that he will accept. Which is why Paul says, look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. The time is short. And every single one of us, friends, very soon will face a holy God, which means we must all answer for ourselves this question. If indeed God's holiness requires punishment for sin, what's your plan for paying the penalty and satisfying his just wrath? In 2 Peter 3, Peter quotes Jesus saying, The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear. The elements will be destroyed by fire. The earth and everything in it will be laid bare. If indeed God is holy and his anger at sin is warranted because of his holiness and you do not have a perfect plan for paying that penalty and satisfying his just wrath, then friends, (laughs) by faith, take courage that in Christ today can be the day of your salvation. Because you understand that in the cross of Christ alone by which he is a full payment for actual sin by an actually holy God, you can have a perfect forever relationship with a holy God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're here because we know that our sin before you is what condemns us. We know that unbelief in your son, Jesus Christ, is an already condemnation that if not taken care of through belief in him, means we are forever condemned. We are the guilty ones who are punished. So Father, speak to hearts. Renew in us a right spirit. Make us clean because of what you do your son Jesus who is for us a propitiation that satisfies all the wrath that you justly bring on sin. Father, we stand behind the righteousness of Christ, holding him up as our salvation, acknowledging that without you putting him forward for us, we have no hope.
Lord, impress upon us the amazing truth that our love for you, our understanding of grace, our passion for the gospel, the motivation for us proclaiming the good news comes from understanding that it's a victory you've won for us. For we would be lost and dead forever apart from you. Thank you for being just, for maintaining your holiness, and yet also being for us the one who justifies. Make of us people who live in light of that amazing truth, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.